where the ancestral farmhouse is abandoned in favour of the sort of bungalow which would be more appropriate to the Coventry bypass. Old homes can, of course, be sympathetically restored, modernised or extended for less outlay than the price of a new house. The reverse of the deliberate renunciation of the old type of home occurs where urban development encroaches on a small holding against the wishes of the occupant. This new main road on the outskirts of Galway has turned what was a quiet byway into a main traffic route. Naturally, a site in what an auctioneer would call a prime location must be greatly coveted by the obvious predators, but where a tenant of several generations is unwilling to pull up roots, the resulting battle can be prolonged and bitter. The factory represents a further threat. Only the visitor from abroad stops to photograph the cottage because it is pretty and Irish. While we may generally think of the various types of thatched house as being the truly Irish dwelling, stone roofs are much more common in some parts of the country where thatching material is not available, but where stone is everywhere. Such a place is the neighbourhood of Liscana in County Clare. The mirror of these two houses has been carefully renovated by an overseas visitor and furnished in the rustic manner. Removal of old plaster has revealed the immense stone slab over the fireplace. The original occupants might be a little surprised at the artful arrangement of crockery or the installation of the decorative Victorian cooking stove. The second house is owned by a man whose people have been in North Clare for generations. Here the kitchen has all the appearance of being lived in. Here mementos of parents and grandparents and souvenirs of visits from relatives in England and America form the background. Here children have played, old people have told stories about their childhood, milk has been churned, bread baked, the seasons have been counted and a watch kept on the livestock and the tillage. Even the potatoes are protected by stone walls. The slabs, which are used for every imaginable purpose, are Liscano flags, or Moher flags, called after the cliffs of Moher not far away. The layer of soil covering the stone is sometimes only a few inches deep, but it's fertile soil supporting fine cattle. And the southerly tilt of the land from Moher to Liscano Bay makes it a warm land, in spite of the grey stone roofs. There must have been a great love of building here in the old days. Even the bridges over small streams are interestingly shaped, enhancing the natural topography. The triangular cattle shed, contrived in the wedge between road and stream, is roofed with flags and will stand for as many hundred years as you care to think. There are a number of small quarries in the neighbourhood, but surprisingly few are commercially owned. The rock is layered horizontally. However many flags you uncover, there's always another waiting underneath. hollow sound indicates where the flag is likely to crack. Years, perhaps generations of experience, tell exactly where to scrape the line which will induce a comparatively straight break. Rhythmically prizing, the stone cutting takes on an aspect of some old age dance or ritual.
climax of the drama. The large flag is cut into two of more manageable size. The outer layers are chipped off. These small flags can be used in the building of walls or for crazy paving in someone's suburban garden. The raised swirl pattern in the stone has been attributed to the petrification of millions of prehistoric eels or the incessant movement of water in primeval times, whichever story you care to believe. In their native place, the flags are put to several uses beyond that of mere roofing and flooring. Everywhere you look, the jagged edge of upright stones are to be seen in the guise of fences, and very practical they are too. They give excellent shelter for growing crops, they're difficult to climb over, and they're economical of land space. They take up far less acreage on a farm than hedges and ditches.